stopped. Hallelujah. And so, uh, but if you have any kind of need, people are saying, hey, if somebody can't get out for whatever reason and they need something, you know, I know Tony Jenkins has told me this several times, you know, call me. If for some reason, I, I don't think there's a great shortage of, of things out there by and large, although I don't think Margaret and I have brought any toilet paper since this happened. She had a pretty good supply, but, uh, but, but I know people. I've had people tell me, don't worry about it. I've got a big supply. So if you need some or anything else, if you will just call us, we, we have people that are willing to come and help you do anything or, or help you get connected up to the right kind of thing you need. And uh, I guess most of all, we just want to say how much we love you. Uh, you know, the last couple of days, we've, we have to do different things with our schools, so we weren't here at all last week. But the last couple of days, our teachers have been up here, and they've set up desks all over our gym and got the students packages and work ready and so pe parents would come in and uh, you know at different times and pick up the things and so forth and every once in a while I'll see and I, when I see somebody I say I'm glad to see your face you know I see a few people but there's so many of you that I haven't seen so uh, so like I said just bottom line we want you to know that we love you and uh, we miss you and uh, we look forward to this being over amen. amen praise God well let's look at Matthew chapter 24 we'll begin in verse number one I want to talk to you tonight about, or my title tonight is Signs, Events, and End Times. Signs, Events, and End Times. And you know, times like this, this pandemic, just, just naturally stir up thoughts of, it, of end times, which is okay, because we should always be eternally minded. We should never just forget about spiritual realities ever. We should always be mindful of the fact that Jesus is coming back. Glory to God. And we should live ready like he is coming back and not just during, during these times. Amen. We shouldn't ever be like the five foolish virgins who were not ready. We should be ready. We should be spiritually alert and watching and actively involved. Uh, so we want to talk about signs, events, and end times. But, but let me quickly say this. This will be general information that many Christians basically, I don't think I'm wrong about this. Most Christians won't know what I'm, won't, won't know this information. But it's just general information, but it's not specifically about the current events. Although current events to a certain degree do uh, apply here because, you know, this, this corona virus is what? It's an infectious virus. Amen. And, uh, and the Bible uses the term pestilence to talk about these type of things. And so, for instance, we're going to read, we're reading here from Matthew 24. Now, I'll say this to you several times because I want you to get this point. Uh, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13 are sister chapters. This is, this is all Jesus answering questions to the disciples who ask him about when will be the sign of your coming or when will be the end of the age and so forth. These are all the same, you know, all these chapters deal with this. And you have to read all three chapters to get, you know, the, the whole story. Because Matthew says certain things, and some of them say the same things, but you have to read all of them. You know that to get the full story. And so in, in Luke's gospel, again, Luke 21, Matthew 24, and Mark 13, in Luke chapter 21, in verse number 11, it talks about pestilences, talking about the last days. It talks about pestilences. Well, the Amplified Bible translates pestilences as plagues, listen to this, uh, malignant and contagious or infectious epidemic diseases which are deadly and devastating. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? That's what a pestilence is. A malignant and contagious or infectious epidemic disease or diseases which are deadly and devastating. But even then, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, but, but you'll be able to follow me and listen carefully. You have to keep two things in mind when he talked about that. In context is where he talks about wars and rumors of wars. You remember that? He talks about famines. He talks about earthquakes. And then he talks about these pestilences or plagues these, and so on. Well, these things by and of themselves, watch this, are not signs of his soon return. They are not in and of themselves signs of the return of the Lord Jesus. So he says, well, you just read it. No, you have to understand since, since the fall of man, there's always been wars. There's always been rumors of wars. There's always been famine. There's always been earthquakes. There's always been uh, these pestilence and plagues and viruses and so forth. They've always been around since the fall of man. So, so, but these events, what, what he's saying is these events will intensify 
and become more frequent before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So no one single thing is necessarily a sign of his return. And so that's number one. Number two, the events he's talking about intensify. Now, now perk up your ears here. He's saying these things will intensify during the tribulation. These are things that happen in the beginning of the tribulation. And of course, the, the things that happen in the beginning, the first three and a half years of the tribulation, seven year tribulation, the first three and a half years is bad, but the last three and a half years is tribulation like the world has never, ever seen. And so these are things that, in other words, these scriptures that Jesus is talking about apply to those who are already in the tribulation and we are not in the tribulation. I'll say some things about this in a minute and you'll understand that better. But he's talking to Jews. He's talking to them about what's going to happen to them. He's not talking to the church. He's talking to Jews about what's going to happen to them during the tribulation when he talks about when these things increase. But I do believe, you know, that, I mean, I don't think with just everything's normal, then the seven-year, you know, then the rapture of the church comes and the seven-year tribulation starts. But when we get up to the rapture of the church or before the tribulation, I do believe we will see an intensification of these things to a certain degree. As we, do you understand what I'm saying? Till we come up to that point. So these events may increase leading up to the tri tribulation. So this pandemic is just one, one of many events that will intensify as we get closer to the second coming. And I do believe, I do believe, it's my opinion that we, as we get closer to the rapture of the church, we will see more and more of these type things happen. Now, with that in mind, Matthew 24, verse number one. Very interesting. You're going to like this. Matthew 24, verse number one. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, you know, the temple in his day, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. They were very excited about the temple. They were very proud of the temple. See, this particular temple was, it was rebuilt or refurbished by Herod. Now, Herod was an extremely, extremely wicked person, but he was a terrific architect. <laughs> he was a wicked man, but he was a terrific architect. And this, I'm telling you, this temple in the day of Jesus, the temple that he went into, it was magnificent. It, it, it was beautiful. It was extremely impressive. So again, uh, in, in Mark's gospel, remember the three chapters. You have to read all three of them. What are they again? Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21. In Mark 13, when he talks about the temple uh, and he addresses the same events, you know, addresses the same events. So in Mark 13, 1, the, the disciples who were very proud and impressed with the temple, they came out and they said, oh, Jesus, look at the temple. And they particularly talked about how impressive the stones the stones of the temple were. I was saying that because in a minute, Jesus is going to say not one of these stones shall be left. And so they mentioned the stone. They said, look at these stones. The New Living Translation says, look at the impressive stones in the walls. All right? So are you with me? I can't see your face, but I'm looking at you guys. Are you with me? All right, good. Amen. And so, so they, they come, and, they, and so Jesus comes out. You know, in verse number, they, they show these stones to Jesus. They show the temple, the buildings, and they're particularly impressed and particularly mention the stones of the temple and how impressive they were and so forth. So in Matthew 24, 2, back to Matthew, Matthew 24, 2, and Jesus said to them, this was his answer to them when they talked about the temple and the stones, do you see all of these things? Verily I say unto you, assuredly I say unto you, this is an absolute truth, I say unto you, not one stone, so they talked about stones, not one stone shall be left here upon another and shall not be thrown down. The Message Bible says there's not one stone in that building that is not going to end up in a pile of rubble. That's interesting. You know, one commentary I read said that, that some of these stones, now we're talking about an individual stone, okay. Not, not, this is just one stone. said some of these stones were 94 feet long. Think about that. Think about a stone that's over 30 yards long, 10 and a half feet high. This thing's 30 yards long, over 30 yards. It's almost 11 foot tall and 13 feet wide. That is an impressive, massive stone. Can you say Amen. And so, uh, uh, and there were 162 marble columns. So we have all this stonework and all this beauty, and these are massive stones. Well, this temple was destroyed 
as Jesus said it would be. That already happened. It happened in the past. Amen. That happened in A.D. 70. And so 2,000 years later, I'm told that if you, you know, take one of these trips to Israel, that your tour group might go see the ruins of the temple. And when people look at the ruins of the temple, people are still, it's all rubble now, but there are still, you know, these stones are all broke up, but some of these stones are still so tremendously large and massive that people just are like wowed by the size of these storms, stones. They're so impressive. They're so big still today. You know, and this is when they're all broken up. So, so Jesus prophesied the temple would be totally destroyed, that the temple would be demolished. Amen. He said not one of these stones would remain in place. So about 40 years later, after Jesus prophesied this in 70 A.D., the Romans, led by Titus, burned and destroyed the temple and left it in ruins, exactly as Jesus had prophesied. I said all of that, and this is very important, very, very important because it sets up a great key to understanding what Jesus taught about in times and the second coming found in Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21. Now remember, you understand this, of course, this isn't everything that's taught about in times, but, but this is what Jesus talked about in times in response to the disciples' questions. So watch this, verse number 3. They come to him. They talk about the beauty of the temple. They particularly mention the stones. Jesus says not one stone will be left upon itself. It will all be destroyed. That already happened, as I mentioned before. And then in verse number 3, it says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately asking him, Tell us when, when will these things be? When will the temple be destroyed? And... What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So the disciples asked Jesus two questions, or you could say three questions, you know, one, one question and the second question with two parts, or you could break the second question up and say three questions. But they asked him, you know, depending on how you count these, these questions. Number one, they asked, when will these things be? In other words, when will the temple with its large, impressive stones be destroyed and... See, and what will be the sign of your coming? So when they said, when will these things play, take place, they're referring to the temple because they go on to say, and when will be the sign of your coming? And the third question, or part two of the second question, what will be the sign of your coming and the sign of the end of your age? So here's where some confusion enters in and people misunderstand some things. You have to determine which question Jesus is answering or you'll get confused. Amen. You cannot make his reply to when will the temple be destroyed apply to end time events. That's something that already took place. And so you can't apply what he said about that to his second coming. It doesn't apply there. And I'll get a little ahead of myself. You can't apply anything that he says in these passages, these three chapters, what about Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, to the rapture because he's not talking about the rapture period. That's part of the Pauline revelation to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking to Jews about their future and end time events for the Jews. So you see, if you try to apply any of this to what he said to the rapture, it won't make sense. If you try to apply what he said when the temple would be destroyed, it won't make sense. You follow that? Amen. Actually, the answer to the question, when will the temple be destroyed, is not even found in Matthew 24. Now, it was found at that exact same time when Jesus was talking to his disciples, but Matthew doesn't tell us everything. You have to go read what Luke said, and you have to go read what Mark said to get everything. So, so you find the answer to this question over in Luke 21. So let's just go over there and look at that. Luke 21, Luke 21, verse 20, Luke 21, 20. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now he's not talking about flee to the mountains about his second coming, although there may be some application. He's talking about something that's already happened. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is, desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things shall be written, all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant, 
and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon the land, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Amen. Glory to God. And so, so that's Jesus' answer to when will the temple, what are the signs of the temple being destroyed, which I let, like I said, has already happened. So let me just, there's a lot of things I could say here. Uh, but for time's sake, and I think this is well written, let me read you something by Warren Wiersbe as he gives his commentary on this. Warren Wiersbe, I really like his commentary, his B commentary. You know, he has one of the whole Bible. And he's a denominational Baptist type minister, very sound. And so he says, Luke accounts, Luke's account, now he's talking about the exact scriptures we just read, those scriptures we just read. He said, Luke's account refers not... Luke's account, what we just read, refers not to a distant event to occur during the tribulation, but to the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus and the Roman army in A.D. 70, just 40 years from the time that Jesus said this. This terrible event was in many respects a dress rehearsal for what will happen when Satan vents his anger of Israel and the believing Gentiles during the last half of the tribulation. The Jewish historian Josephus claimed that nearly a million people, think about that, a million people were killed by the Romans and over 100,000 taken captive when Titus captured the city. Amen. Glory to God. Now, so let me say some things here. He says, he says, he says this has already happened. It's already been destroyed. You can't apply that to, in, to, to the second coming. He's not talking about the second coming. He's talking about how it would be before Jerusalem was just destroyed and Jerusalem's already been, that time it was already destroyed. Now, he does say it, it is possibly a dress rehearsal. And I like the way he says that. In other words, uh, uh, like I said, you can't make these verses apply to events leading up to the second coming or to events occurring leading up to the rapture. But they are, as he says, a dress rehearsal, so to speak. Meaning there are some similarities to what happened back then to what will happen during the tribulation when Satan tries to destroy Israel and specifically Jerusalem again. Now let me continue reading Warren Wiersbe. He said, this was not the first time Jerusalem would be trodden down of the Gentiles. Notice that phrase, trodden down by the Gentiles. For the Babylonians had in the past destroyed the city in 586 B.C. when the time of the Gentiles began. So what does he mean when he talks about, could you see that expression, the time of the Gentiles? Well, very simply, the times of the Gentiles is to a greater or a lesser degree times that started way, way back when the Gentiles, the nations, people, you know, people that are not Jews and people that are not Christians have tried to one degree or another to destroy or have destroyed Jerusalem. See, so that's what the times of the Gentiles is just simply uh, when, the, when the Gentiles have Jerusalem under its thumb and try to rule over it or try to destroy over it. And the times of the Gentiles in one degree or another uh, will stand until it's fully liberated at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ where he defeats the Antichrist and the enemies of the God. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So that's what he's talking about. Uh, he said, believers today who are looking for their Lord's return should not apply Luke 21, 20 through 24 to their own situation. Jesus was talking about Jerusalem, as we said. In Matthew 24 and the rest of Mark 13, he was speaking about Israel's situation, Israel, not the churches, but Israel's situation in the middle of the tribulation. Since our Lord's coming for the church will take place in the twinkling of an eye, no one will have time to go back home for a coat. That's going to happen instantaneously. You, you will have time, nor will we have to worry about traveling on the Sabbath or, carry, or caring for nursing babies. I can tell you one way that you know this is not talking to the church. The church doesn't give two hoots about the Sabbath. You've got to understand, if you're an Orthodox Jew, the Sabbath is a very, very big deal. And he's saying, hey, when you're under this pressure and under this tribulation, this great tribulation, oh, if you're pregnant and you're trying and you've got to escape, that's going to make it difficult. If it's, the, if it's wintertime, that's going to make it difficult. And because if you're an Orthodox Jew and that's who Jesus is talking about, that's going to make it difficult because it's the Sabbath. But the church doesn't care about the Sabbath. <laughs> 
I, we worship God on Sunday. We worship God on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. We live for God every day of the week. We're, we're not under the Sabbath. Praise God. So you have to realize that, that the rest of these chapters in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, except for that little portion I just read, all these verses refer to Israel and the events that happened to Israel during the tribulation. Of course, the rest of the world will be involved to one degree or another, but primarily these events will be taking place in the Middle East. Again, the rest of the world will be, will be certainly influenced by these things. So there's, there's no scripture in these chapters that, that talk about the catching away of the church or the rapture of the church. Like I said, that's found elsewhere. Praise God. But as, apply, but as these things applying specifically to the Jews, just as an example, let's go back again to Matthew 24. Just as an example, go back to Matthew 24, verse number 20. That's what I just read. And pray that your flight be not in the winter. And I talked about that. Amen. So, so he's talking about, you know, let him on the housetop, no, not go down to take anything. Let, let, you know, Jesus is coming in the twinkling of an eye for us. You don't have time to come down from the housetop, and you're certainly not concerned about the Sabbath. No, he's talking to the Jews about what's going to happen to them during the tribulation. Amen? Glory to God. Somebody says, yeah, but you need to read verse 22 of Matthew 24, which says, And unless those days were shortened, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. See, the elect's sake. Well, the elect there is not the church. He's talking about the Jews, the apple of God's eye, the elect. Amen. And, and, and no flesh would be saved if we don't endure. Are we saved by endurance? No, we're saved by grace. He's talking to the Jews about the tribulation. And as one man put it, he said it this way, the atmosphere of this discourse, the atmosphere of this whole teaching that Jesus is doing here is Jewish. It's heavily Jewish. He's talking, he goes on to say, he's talking to Jewish people about, he mentions Judea, he mentions Sabbath, and he mentions the prophecy of Daniel to the Jews. Glory to God. And you see, so people get confused because they don't understand that. Did you ever, did you ever wonder why what Paul said about marriage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7? Listen to this, it'll help you. Did you ever wonder why what Paul said about marriage and divorce and remarriage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7? is different than what Jesus said in the four Gospels about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. So he said, no, it's not different. No, yeah, it's different. They can't be reconciled. Now you can be like some people, see, because you may or may not be aware of this, but theologians and, and uh, commentaries have argued over these scriptures for years and years and years, and one preacher famously said, well, because you see, he couldn't reconcile. He said, I don't know what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm just prone to follow Jesus. Well, that sounds good, but it's not the answer. See, you have to understand, Jesus was talking to the Jews, and he was perfectly interpreting the law of Moses to the Jews about marriage and divorce. Paul is not talking to the Jews. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul is talking to the church. He's talking to those that are born again who are under what law? Are we under the law? No. We are under the law of love. He's interpreting marriage, divorce, and remarriage in the light of the law of love. What would love do? What would love do? So there is no, there is no contradiction. And so simply put, Jesus is talking to the Jews and Paul is talking to the church. And you have to always, here's the point I want you to get, you have to always, 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 always be aware of who God is talking to. See, 1 Corinthians, and then God's only talking to one of three people. In 1 Corinthians 10, 32, it says, Give none offense, neither to the Jew, nor the Gentile, or Gentiles, or sometimes it's better translated, the nations. There's, you're either a Jew, you're a Gentile, nor the church of God. Amen. Everybody falls into one of those categories. You're either a born-again Christian in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a Jew, or you're a Gentile, somebody that has not been born again and part of those ungodly nations. And each group has a different future. So Jesus, glory to God, in these chapters, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13, is talking to the Jews about their future and what happens to them in the tri tribulation and what's leading up to his second coming. 
You see, because the tribulation's already started and you're going to see this happen and then you're going to see this happens and then Jesus is going to come back and defeat the Antichrist. Uh, amen. When it, now, when it comes to what we call, generally speaking, the coming of the Lord, there are two main parts to consider. Number one is the rapture. That's where the church, of, the church where believers are caught up or raptured in the air to meet the Lord Jesus Christ and then the seven-year tribulation period starts. And that's number one. Number two is the second coming is when Jesus literally comes. See, when the, when the rapture comes, he doesn't he didn't come all the way to the earth. And when the rapture, during the second coming, he comes and puts his feet, you know, on the mountain and he defeats the Antichrist and, and establishes earthly kingdom and that's the end of the great tribulation. Somebody says, well, you know, the word rapture is not even in the Bible. Did you know that's true? The word rapture is not in the Bible. But let's talk about that. Let's talk about that, that a little bit because this very directly applies to us. 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, very interesting, 16, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Man, I'm doing, I'm doing Pastor Caleb, our, our youth pastor, a, a solid tonight. He's wanting to reach out and connect with our kids, and of course they can't come to church, so he's having a, a video conference chat thing, whatever you call it, on Instagram to talk about the service tonight, and I'm preaching on end times. <laughs> Glory to God. Have at it, brother. Answer those questions those youth ask you. 1 <laughs> first, first Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself... They're talking to people that are still here on the earth. Let's back up and read 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, not his second coming, but the rapture, will by no means precede those who died in the Lord. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and together shall be caught up, underline that, shall be caught up together, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord therefore be in great fear over these words no wait a minute that's not what it says therefore comfort one another be encouraged uh, and encourage one another because of these words amen so notice that expression shall be caught up shall be caught up in the air well, the Greek word literally means to be caught up. That's all one phrase, shall be caught up, means to snatch or carry away. What does rapture mean? Rapture means to be to carry a person from one place to another place. Translate or transfer a person from one sphere of existence or from one world to the next world. That's what rapture means. And so the Greek word means to, to snatch or carry away. Very interesting. Acts 8, 39 says that the Spirit excuse me, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip or caught Philip away. You remember that. We like that story. Philip was translated from one place to the next. I mean, he baptized a eunuch in water and all of a sudden he was, he was as it says, Philip was caught away. He was translated from one place and he was found in another city. Amen. So he was caught away. Now, when he was caught away, when he was translated, that means divine power transferred him supernaturally. Divine power transferred him supernaturally and quickly from one place to another. See, God doesn't do it. This, is, this whole idea of rapture is not a new idea with God. It is something that has happened many times in the Bible. There are seven raptures in the Bible. Eight if you count Philip. So he was divinely Divine power transferred him or translated him supernaturally and quickly from one place to another. He was snatched away. He was carried away. And so the and, and, and the words caught away Philip are the exact same words translated caught up here in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. We shall be caught up together, caught away with Philip. Same exact Greek word. Caught up. Amen. If that's not being raptured, then I don't know what is. Our English word rapture comes from the Latin word R-A-P-T-O, which means to seize or carry off. And, and, and this isn't, like I said, it's not a new thing with God at all. Enoch, 
It says, you know, he pleased God. Hebrews 11 tells us that. He pleased God. He walked with God. And it says, God took him. What does that mean? He was raptured. He was raptured. He, he was raptured to heaven. Somebody said, no, he just died. No, that's not true. Because Hebrews 11, 5 and 6 says, he was translated. So he didn't just die. He was translated. The Amplified Bible says he was caught up to heaven. He was translated to heaven or called up to heaven that he should not see death. That's a rapture. That's a rapture. Amen. So there's an example. Again, it's not, it's not anything strange or new with God. Elijah was taken up or caught up or raptured to heaven. Who are you with me? Jesus, you know, when his final appearance to the disciples, as he was standing there talking to him, then the Bible says he was taken up before their eyes. He was taken up or he was caught up or he was raptured into the clouds right before his, their eyes. And he said, in the same manner, I shall come again. There's another rapture. Glory to God. So, so we see the, and then we see, so it's not a strange thing. Let me put it that way. It's not a strange thing, except that it'll be more than one person, that the church will be raptured. No big deal to God. Praise God. I like that definition I gave. Well, it goes my own definition. But we will, by divine power, we will be transferred supernaturally and quickly from, from earth to meet Jesus in the air. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. And this all takes place before the events of the great tribulation. One reason we know that is 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. What is the tribulation? Tribulation is seven years of the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb of God being poured out like never before. And Thessalonians 1.10, that's why I believe that the wrath... I mean, if you don't believe that we're going to be, you know, you, you may be post-rapture, pre-rapture, mid-tri, you know, whatever. If you don't believe we will be raptured, that's okay. be no reason to, 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 to lose fellowship over or no reason to fight about some people, some one man said, he said, you know, I'm a pan uh, millennialist. I believe it'll all pan out in the end, you know. Uh, Pre-trib, pre days I'm a pan, whatever. Anyway, Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. That's just one scripture. First Thessalonians 5, 9 says, God has not appointed us to wrath. Revelation 6, 16, I just mentioned that. We're almost through here. It says, the tribulation will be a time when the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb of God will be poured out on the earth as never before. Romans 5, 9 says, having been justified by His blood. Or have you been justified by His blood? We've been made right by His blood. We've been washed by His blood. We've been delivered from the power of the devil and the power of sin by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, having been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Glory to God. Now, at the same time, we know, because Paul tells us this, that in the last days, you know, in the last of the last days, perilous times will come. That means hard to deal with times. Difficult times will come. And, and he lists all those things that we see happening. And, and, you know, we see all of that. But listen, the promises of God never change. The Word of God never changes. No matter what happens, the promises of God never change. So we should not operate in fear. We should always walk in faith. We should always walk in joy. We should always walk in peace. And we should always walk in love. Glory to God. And we should believe as these things begin to happen more frequently, even up to the time of the tribulation, as I believe they will. I believe these are signs of the times. Even what's going on is, is maybe a small, it's part of the signs of the times. We, we, should, we, we should believe, whether it's this or, or one of a hundred other things, we should believe that we are protected and we should believe that we are provided for. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. I said amen. amen. Glory to God. We shouldn't and we shouldn't. We didn't look at those scriptures. but one, what, what Jesus tells the church and what Paul tells the church, which is Jesus talking to us, over and over again, we get all caught up in the beast and this and the scriptures and all that. But what the church is told over and over again is, is be ready and be alert. Be watchful. Be ready. And what that really means is, is just simply be on top of your game spiritually. In other words, don't get caught up in the spirit of the world. Don't get caught up in the lust of the flesh. Don't get caught up in other things. Be eternally minded. Live for Jesus. Be on fire for Jesus. 
walk in fellowship with Jesus, love Jesus, and you be ready. Don't be like the five foolish virgins who weren't ready. You always be ready. That's what he specifically tells us. And, and you see, in time events, I'm, I'm closing with this, the, the very first person that ever made any sense to me at all about in time was events was a man by the name of Hilton Sutton. I'm sure almost all of you are familiar with him. And he got up and said, in time events are not doom and gloom for the church, not doom and gloom for the believer. And I thought, they're not. I always, I always thought they were. I always thought we had to run and hide and be afraid. And, you know, we're all going to be killed or worse during the, you know, that's that. No, he said, it's not defeat for the church. It's defeat for the devil. It's defeat for the Antichrist. It's defeat for the enemies of God. It's not our destruction. It's their destruction. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus even told these Jews who were going to be involved in, or the Jews that would be on the earth and living during the tribulation. He said, when you see these things, lift up your head. In other words, lift up your head and rejoice. Your redemption draws near. Glory to God. So it's not doom and gloom for Christians, but we should stay ready. We should not get caught up in the spirit of this world and, and in living for self and just living for the pleasure. We should be encouraged and be alert spiritually. And again, it's the Antichrist, it's the devil, and it's the enemies of God. It's doom and gloom for them. Glory to God. So, continue to rejoice, sisters and brothers. I used to say brothers and sisters. I don't know why. I said sisters and brothers. I don't know that. Continue to rejoice. Be glad in the Lord. Walk by faith. And just continue to do the will of God till He comes. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Because as somebody said a long time ago, read the back of the book. We win. Read it again. We still win. And read it again. We still win. And we are winning. Hallelujah. We are victorious. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph. Amen. So, Father, I pray for these. I pray for these here. I pray for these listening. I thank you that we are protected, not just from the coronavirus, but from all things that would try to steal, kill, and destroy. For you came to give us life, and life more abundantly. But it's the thief, it's the devil that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I thank you that we are protected, and I thank you that we are blessed, and we are, we are financially provided for, because your word never changes. Glory to God. So I thank you for these, I thank you for these that are watching, and I thank you that the, for, for the glorious things that are going to happen in the future for us. And Lord God, help us to be about what you said to them as you said occupy in other words be about my business till I come that's your responsibility be about my business be preaching the gospel be teaching people get people saved get people healed get people delivered get people you know established in the things of the kingdom of God hallelujah so that's our job that's our business and uh, we look forward to the day that we will all be with you together forever and ever in the meantime we're going to occupy we're going to be about your business and doing the will of God and we're going to do it without intimidation and without fear as you courageously embolden us because we believe the truths of your word. Amen. Can you say amen? God bless you. God bless you. We love you. If we, uh, uh, Most of you we probably won't see, but we'll be back here Sunday morning. We hope that you'll join in with us live. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus.